Hello, I'm Robert Martin, a state historian of New Mexico, and this is New Mexico history in 10 minutes. In 1760, Fray Juan Jose Toledo, the priest at Abacu, New Mexico, wrote a letter to local government officials with an alarming statement. His pueblo was in the grip of the devil and there were many deaths associated with the practice of witchcraft and sorcery. This was the opening of the witchcraft case at Abitu, New Mexico's version of the Salem witchcraft trials, but with a very different kind of people and a different outcome. As I said earlier, witchcraft and sorcery, brujeria y hechicería, are integral to Hispanic, Puebloan and all New Mexico culture really and is found in places all around the world, peoples all around the world. However, in New Mexico it takes on a really unique twist in the 1760s when uh, the priest, Fray Juan Jose Toledo, encounters uh, what he considers to be a school of sorcerers led by local Genisaro Indians, uh, a man by the name of um, Miguel Ontiveros El Cojo, he walks with a limp, is said to have a pact with the devil and that he uses spirits and incantations to control the local population. Other people accused are another man named Agustin Tarlin. Other people accused are people such as a man named Agustin. Other people accused include a man named Agustin Tagle, he's also a Henisaro Indian and said to be a powerful sorcerer. Women are accused, a woman named uh, Tole Caliente and another La Comegainas, Petrona. Uh, they're powerful witches, powerful sorcerers who have, are said to have killed uh, Toledo's predecessor, Father Ordonez, and are now trying to bring demonic influences into not just Abiquiu, but the kingdom and province of New Mexico. Well, if we look back into Father Toledo's past, he was from Mexico City, the son of Spanish parents. He was uh, educated at the Convento de San Francisco. He's a Franciscan priest. And we know that he likely had a lot of indoctrination in belief in demonic activity, the practice of witchcraft, and the need to eradicate such practices from Native American peoples. There are um, manuals for uh, guiding priests on how to interact with Native peoples in the Americas, and if you look at them, there are sections on superstition, love magic, and of course, uh, witchcraft and sorcery. So he had this in mind. We know that he had a book in his possession uh, that was published uh, in the 17. 20s and an earlier version from the 1670s that dealt with uh, witchcraft, sorcery, and how to deal with people who are possessed by evil spirit. We know this because one of his letters is plagiarized from these manuals of exorcism and witchcraft. So he had this in his mind. So we need to keep this uh, in our perspective, when we think he goes to the Genisaro Pueblo of Abiquiu around 1750, and he's seeing things through the filter of his Catholic, Spanish, and heavily Franciscan viewpoint. Now, these Genisaros, as we have talked about earlier, were Hispanicized, I wouldn't say heavily Hispanicized, but they knew the Hispanic culture and they probably had heard witchcraft stories, witchcraft beliefs from the Hispanic people and from priests and from government officials uh, through the decades. So they also knew what scared Fray Juan Jose Toledo. So we need to keep this in mind what's happening at Abiquiu. Also, there's this idea of curanderismo, folk healing, that gets mixed up with brujeria and hechiceria, and it happens in a very thick way in New Mexico. So, supposedly what's happening in Abiquiu 
is that the people are being bewitched. Uh, an illness befalls the people, and it's an illness that can be described as causing anxiety, fever, dehydration, and intestinal problems, movement in the stomach, and ultimately uh, the person's uh, teeth dry up, their tongue turns black, and they pass away in a very painful and horrible way. Um, some of the details are a little grotesque. They say that the stomach of the victim opens up and uh, beetles and uh, worms and other insects come out of the person. And it's definitely causing a lot of anxiety and problems, not just in Abiquiu, but the problem starts to spread into places like Santa Cruz de la Cañada and ultimately reaches Santa Fe and even Santo Domingo. At one point, uh, Fray Juan José Toledo himself is uh, afflicted by the illness. Uh, he consider considers it a be bewitching. He consults a local curandera, a Native American folk healer, and he has uh, one of the magistrates, Carlos Fernandez, witness it so that he can make sure she doesn't bewitch him even further. So there's right there is this idea that curanderas were also witches and vice versa. Um, it doesn't help that at one point in the description of this situation, Atole Caliente and Comegainas are said to pose as curanderas to help some of the sick people. They go into their homes and when they leave, uh, the people are even worse than they were before. One of the uh, nastier uh, uh, symptoms of this problem is demonic possession. And this is the only witchcraft case in New Mexico during the colonial period where we see actual so-called cases of possession and exorcism take place. There are five young ladies. Uh, some of them are native women. Some of them are Hispanic women. They're, they're young, probably aging, uh, probably uh, in age from about 12 till about probably in age from about 12 years old to 17 years old. And um, they come down with a case of so-called possession, supposedly during mass at the church in Abiquiu when uh, Toledo would uh, raise the host to consecrate. Um, they would fall into fits and scream and yell and uh, pass out. And supposedly they were very difficult to lift off the floor. They would scream and speak in Latin. And ultimately, the priest performed exorcisms on these uh, young ladies uh, in public. During these exorcisms, uh, the young ladies uh, accused many people in New Mexico and Sonora of being witches and sorcerers. And the documents even have a list of about 178 people with physical descriptions and names uh, telling uh, government officials who these so-called witches and sorcerers were. It's quite uh, exciting what's going on in New Mexico, so much so that the governor at the time, Tomas Velez Cachupin, he sends the case down to Mexico City for the Inquisition to look at. The lawyer for the Inquisition says, this is not witchcraft, this is not sorcery, these are not witches and sorcerers, rather it's the priest's fault. He needs to do a better job of evangelizing and catechizing the Henisaro Indians. He needs to learn their languages. Well, the damage is done to a point. About 12 of these folks are arrested and uh, put on trial in Santa Fe. They're housed in Santo Domingo. And ultimately, um, they're sentenced to work uh, the rest of their lives out in uh, Hispano households. I mean, can you imagine that? You're, you're assigned a, a Henisara woman to work for you and she's an accused witch or sorcerer. Um, some of them escaped this fate, um, but some of them died uh, in servitude, essentially. Uh, but it's interesting reading the documents. They describe the ways of witches. Some of these can be found in the books that the priest had, but there are also ideas like... Um, uh, there, it said that some of the witches could fly from uh, New Mexico to parts of uh, Mexico, uh, like um, Guadalupe del Paso or even Mexico City in an egg. Um, they had the ability to move about 
uh, unseen so that they could perform their uh, evil acts and curses. So a lot of these ideas come down to us through the generations uh, into modern times, and we still hear them in New Mexico. Um, it's quite fascinating. Um, we still have these stories here. Um, the idea that if you see an owl, you're walking along a road, if you see an owl in the tree, if you tell the owl, mañana vengas por sal, tomorrow you'll come for salt. And the next day, if somebody knocks on your door and asks to borrow some salt, they're a witch. Also, this idea uh, in old documents and old stories that uh, witches are able to uh, anoint themselves with an evil uh, smelling black ointment. And if they renounce uh, the uh, Christ and they take off their rosary, um, that tells us people wore their rosary with them a lot. Um, and they got on a broom um, and they chanted a certain phrase, they could levitate and fly. There's a story of kids watching witches do it, and then they copy them. And when they start to, to levitate, uh, they cross themselves and say, in the name of the, uh, Jose Maria y Jesus, in the name of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, and they fell to the ground because the invoking the name of Jesus and the saints broke the spell. So these are ideas that come down to us. Um, La Llorona is not a witch. That's a whole other story uh, that comes down to us. But um, this is an aspect of life in New Mexico in the 1700s. Now, before uh, we go to thinking that uh, New Mexico is just a land of witches in the 1700s, it's not true. Um, there are documents uh, in the church records that show that Fray Juan Jose Toledo was baptizing and marrying these same people who were accused of witchcraft. So life was actually quite normal. And you get the idea that while it's very um, uh, exciting and uh, very sensational, this idea of witchcraft and sorcery in New Mexico, it was also a part of daily life and people dealt with this all the time. The idea of spirits and angels uh, everywhere around an adobe wall or in a cañada when you go to uh, herd your sheep or your cows. This was just a part of normal life in 18th century New Mexico. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Bye.